All right. A lot of you guys just got out of an exam. <laughs> you could, what's that? E easy day after that. Nice. So, so now it's now it's just time to to let loose, relax, and. <laughs> um, you guys have many many more classes before break, or is this? Am I, am I the last one standing between? Oh my. No, it, but but a lot of a lot of times if you have a whole bunch of Tuesday Thursday classes and not so many Monday Wednesday Friday, then like break, start. break starts Thursday. Okay. Yeah. So so if you have any Wednesday classes, then yeah. you, you, right. So technically, yeah. All right. Well, we are we are going to go into membrane filtration today. We've talked about granular filtration. Um, so we'll we'll be in membranes today, and then when we return next week, then we'll get into disinfection. So one one way to look at the class, kind of what we've done so far, is um, the first segment was kind of review, some intro to how we do mass balance kind of stuff in environmental systems, and then some of the physical processes, um, especially you know sedimentation, the flocculation, all that. Now we're into still somewhat physical process with the filtration, and then we're going to get into kind of more of the chemical, which is disinfection. Um, the last portion of the class will be more biological in terms of um, growing up a bunch of bacteria to consume waste. Uh, so wastewater treatment is largely a biological process. So that's, you can kind of think of the class divided into mostly physical, mostly chemical, and mostly biological. So we're, we're about to start, not quite the, uh, the chemical side. And filtration can get somewhat chemical if we get it really down to desalination size or scale. Um, but we're going to differentiate. So last time we talked about these granular filters, we had some bed of media, it's packed sand kind of a thing, and the water would flow through. It's not necessarily size exclusion that we're dealing with there, not true filtration in that sense, but it, we call it a filter and it, it filters the water. Um, by sticking the particles places, and we capture them that way. Uh, so a membrane filter then is, uh, we started this way the other day, is like a particle trying to make its way through the screen porch, right? It's gonna block any leaves from blowing in, it's gonna hopefully block the mosquitoes from flying in. Um, it's going to be that semi-permeable barrier, right? We want airflow in that case, but we don't want mosquitoes. So it's gonna be a physical size exclusion for the most part. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're looking at for, for the technology to perform for us. Um, and we'll get into some details about that. So what is a membrane? Um, well, the definition would be some soft, pliable sheet. Um, you could think of a piece of paper. Normally I have some paper. Today I, I took it out of my bag because I, I had some issue. <laughs> Water bottle wasn't quite sealed, so some of my bag got wet this morning. Um, but you could think of a piece of paper or some something like it, you know, this piece of cloth here. It's pliable, probably a flat sheet in general is what you might think of a, as a membrane. Um, and in terms of like biological systems, we usually think of it as something that stuff can pass through while some other stuff cannot pass through. So it's just the same thing. Um, the way we use it, first of all, would be particle removal. Um, so we could use it to remove large particles, just like the granular filtration. We might call this um, microfiltration because we are getting down to the scale near, you know, I don't know, one to ten micrometers. I guess maybe more. Um, then we could talk about ultrafiltration, and that would let us remove one step down, so colloidal particles, stuff that normally would be suspended in water, it would never sediment. So things like maybe as far down as viruses, you never expect a virus to sediment unless you centrifuge it at like 30, 30 G or something, like a crazy, crazy artificial gravity. Um, you'd get bacteria. Um, so that would be any something less really than, um, I'll say 0.4, four or five micrometers is when we typically start thinking of it as 
pore size is that big, we start thinking about that as um, ultrafiltration. We could get down to the point where we are removing large chemicals, uh, maybe pesticides or something. We might call this nanofiltration. And at that point, we're really talking about pore sizes of nanometers, um, but we tend to talk about it rather than in nanometers, we start talking about it in terms of an equivalent molecular weight of some random molecule, that, a large molecule. Um, and so this could be anywhere from around one to you know, 100 nanometers, something like that. Now, when we get down to desalination, um, here's where we are really kind of getting up past the point where it's really a physical size exclusion. And it's more so we are pushing water so hard up against this barrier. And the, the barrier has such small pores that water can kind of make its way through by random motion and, and action. But ionic species, which are not much larger than water, will have a hard time going through. Um, so things like sodium or fluoride that are normally, they're pretty small. It's not that we are completely size excluding them, it's, it's more of a probability exclusion. It's not likely for them to be able to make it through. The pores themselves are not very clearly defined. So this is like um, almost a chemical process um, rather than physical. I mean, it, it's kind of both. Let's say physical and chemical. Um, really, we're dealing with osmosis and the, the pressures required to achieve osmosis. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, so a little bit of history about membranes and their use for water treatment. Well, we've had these, these membranes for some time, maybe 50, 60 plus years, uh, but they really only became common about 30, 30 to 40 years ago by now. And when I mean common, I mean really applied to real water treatment you know, applications. Um, so in the scheme of things, especially compared to the granular filters or chlorine, um, membranes are not, not too new. They are, are they, excuse me, they're not too old. They're relatively new. Um, another uh, generality that we can take a look at is the fact that the pore size, you know, what, whatever we need to uh, try to remove, you know, for scaling down to remove something small, that's inversely proportional to the pressure required. So if we want to get small stuff removed, we have to have a lot of pressure to, to push the water through. That's going to be inherent in, in the scheme of this. It, it doesn't matter how good our filter is, that property will still be there. Even if we make a perfect filter with all it is is these nice perfect pores and it's exactly like two dimensional, so there's very little resistance, it's still going to have resistance to push water through those pores. Okay, so then there's a, a few terms we're gonna need to talk about. And really, really these are terms mostly describing the, the physical aspects of what is a membrane. So these are terms you will see uh, repeatedly. First of all, there's the permeate. So if we have some kind of a, a membrane, I'll just put a flat sheet here, and we are, um, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to draw this in two man, two ways actually. So first, we're going to pretend it's just some sheet that water is flowing through, right? Um, in that case, the permeate would be the stuff going through, right? That's presumably cleaned water. Now, maybe you are you're actually interested in what's not going through. You know, maybe you're if you've ever had like a, a can of juice from concentrate or something, or if you're buying orange juice or something, you'll see from concentrate or not from concentrate. Well, the deal is um, if you wanted to, to make orange juice and ship it across the world, the cheaper way to do that is to concentrate it, um, remove some of the water, but you, you would use a filter to try to keep all the flavors and the particles, keep the orange juice stuff, remove some of the water so when you ship it, you don't pay for shipping all that water. And then when you arrive, you add more water, right? And if it's clean water, then great. You know, you, you've just concentrated and then reconstituted your orange juice. And that was a lot cheaper to ship and handle that. Um, so sometimes we might actually be interested in the concentrate, but the permeate, you know, for normal water treatment, that's what we're interested in. That would be what we might say is clean. 
um, or purified. So that's the, the part of the flow that's going to be cleaned. Now, we might also have something that we have a membrane. Uh, of course, the feed will be what we're feeding to the membrane, the feed solution. Usually that's what we want to clean or maybe concentrate in the orange juice example. Um, and then typically we won't just have the two um, because if we just have the two, that membrane is going to get clogged pretty quick. And it's kind of like a batch system where we'd have to stop it, clean the membrane and start over again. It would be pretty typical. So instead, oftentimes we'll let some of the water flow away from the membrane, not passing through it. And this is what we would call the concentrate or the retentate. So again, in the, the orange juice example, maybe that's what we actually want to collect. So these terms are interchangeable. And as we'll see in a moment, normally we will draw this in some sort of a box diagram where we'll draw a line to say that that line is the membrane. And then we'd have some flows going, some that pass the membrane and some that don't pass the membrane. So we'll, I'm gonna elaborate on that in a moment. Um, but I'm drawing two different pictures here. One is like pretending we can see this, uh, this actual membrane laid out and water flowing through it. And the other is just this box diagram saying, okay, here, this line represents a membrane and a barrier, right? Okay, so those are the, the basic terms. We'll also get into some things about flux. We've already talked a bit about flux with the granular filters. So it should be a pretty similar concept. We'll talk about uh, membrane resistance and pressure requirements, fouling. So we'll, we'll do more than just those terms, but these are the big ones that you really need to know in order to s even see what I'm talking about when I, when I draw up a diagram or something. Okay, so there, there really are two ways to operate a filter. And I just mentioned one uh, where it's, you only have the feed and the permeate. So if we have, let's say a syringe filter, it would look something like this where we have some filter right here, water or some solution in the lab in a, in a syringe, you attach a filter and you push, you squeeze that water through the filter. So you've probably seen these before. I've got a picture of one in a moment. That would be an op, a, uh, an example of a dead end filtration. Um, so th in this case, this would be called dead end. I think I'll have some more slides on that. Whereas this one up here, we'll say this is cross flow. So cross flow is really meaning, like I said a minute ago, some of the water goes away from the membrane without go ever going through it. Um, so we have a feed, a retentate that gets more concentrated, more dirty, and then the permeate, which is the clean stuff. So you'll notice even in this drawing, they show all these little particles in the feed. That's the stuff we want to remove to make this clean permeate. We see all those particles are getting blocked by what we might call the separation layer here. And then this retentate stream, just visibly, they added more of these little particles to demonstrate that it should be dirtier, right? This mass balance here, it's actually gonna be very, very simple mass balance, all the membrane stuff. It's the membrane should reject some, if not all of the particles, and all of the particles, you know, we're not creating or destroying any of these particles or, or whatever we're filtering. And so we could say the Q feed times whatever concentration is in the feed, um, if we call that the uh, Q feed and the concentration in the feed in this, the Q and the, uh, excuse me, the retentate, and the concentration in the retentate, then we have some flow for the permeate concentration there. We could see that just based on the mass balance, what's going in should equal what's going out, right? So QF, CF should equal QP, CP plus um, QR, CR. Likewise, we can do a, a water balance and the same thing happens, right? So uh, all of this should end up feeling pretty intuitive on the, the balance side of things uh, if you recognize that what the filter is doing is just sending the stuff in two different directions, right? And it's on the solute side, it's causing some change. And on the water side, some proportion of it goes one way or the other. So, um, for this diagram up here, I wanted to point something out. So this box diagram for the cross flow, we're always gonna draw some kind of a line to show we've got separation across it. 
Um, it doesn't actually matter too much. You know, we could draw a line that, as long as it segregates the um, the flows, you know, we could technically draw one there. That would be fine. Um, so long as we can demonstrate with this little box figure that water has to cross this line, and if it does, then whatever's on the other side, we could say that's the permeate. Now, in this case, I have it drawn as two lines. Um, in this diagram down at the bottom, you see the permeate's coming from a lot of different pores, right? So it's all collected into one, one flow rate, typically. Um, so maybe we branch that flow rate, or maybe we just say we're really only going to draw three lines. All I want to show you here is that would change. So at, as it's drawn right now, this would be the feed. You see the permeate because it crossed over the line. And now here must be the retentate. Now, if I drew this this way, then now suddenly that's backwards, right? Suddenly the water that's making it through is here and here, and the retentate is the other one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix it, so don't panic on the notes. Um, I just wanted to show you the, it's kind of arbitrary. All you just have to think about is whether or not the water's crossing over the, the line, the filter, right? The memory. Okay, so in, then in the dead end filtration case, we would still call this one the feed, uh, and this down here the permeate. It might be a little more common in the dead end filtration style if we had some water, let's say we, we started here, and then we did some filtration, and now we have this much remaining. Um, we could keep some retentate volume. It wouldn't be a flow, but we'd keep some retentate there and we could call it that, you know, we, we retained, um, we rejected some amount. Um, and this is again why it kind of acts a little bit more like a batch system. So that's not a fee, that's not a flow rate um, in that sense, but could we could stop before filtering all the liquid and retain some amount. Okay, so I, really I, I'm, I guess I'm a little ahead of myself describing all of that, but here's, here's that example for a dead end filtration. This is what I was talking about with a syringe and syringe filter. Uh, this is pretty common in labs if you're doing some sort of sample analysis and you've got particles, maybe you have an instrument that should not be exposed to the particles or something. Um, we use these pretty often. So that would be a dead end flow. There's a no or dead end filtration. There's no retentate flow, even if you do save some for analysis or whatever. Um, whereas this cross flow, like I said, was this will depend on how you draw it. Let's see, what did I do last time? I did top left. So this time we'll do from bottom left. So in this case, we could draw it as feed, retentate, and we can get rid of one of these if we want to and say that's a permeate, right? It really doesn't matter. I hope you see now that when you see these diagrams, just do it according to how the box makes sense. Okay, another example of the dead end filtration here. If you had, if you ever seen one of these in a laboratory, you would fill this beaker thing with water. Uh, it has a glass support, so you can place a membrane right on top here. So you have a membrane, and then you apply a vacuum. Here, and then you'd put some dish here to catch your permeate. So that would be a pretty typical way to filter water, again, in a lab, a little bit bigger scale than just a syringe filter. Um, so you'll see that pretty, pretty commonly. Um, one thing to note here is that the pressure that you can achieve to drive this, this water through this membrane, if you're using a vacuum to apply that pressure, you're limited to the atmospheric pressure of our atmosphere. So if you were to do that on Jupiter, where you have a big atmospheric pressure, uh, then you could get a much higher pressure for your membrane if you could achieve a perfect vacuum. Um, even if we achieve a perfect vacuum, we only have one atmosphere of pressure, so that's, that's our pressure. 
Um, so we can't do everything with vacuum filtration, but we can do a fair amount. We could also apply pressure to the, the front side. So either way, we're going to drive this with uh, pressure one way or another. Okay, so to take a look at a, a um, cross-flow filtration example, these can look like a lot of different things. Um, they can take take a lot of different forms in, in terms of the physical appearance, the physicality of the actual membranes. And we're going to take a look at some of that today. This particular one, uh, we can see that there is a membrane right here. And this is actually a cylindrical membrane. So it's, it's going to look, if you were to take a close look at it, it's going to look a little bit like this, where um, this is a cylinder and in this particular case, it has the separation layer on the inside. So this inner part has the pores and then water is going to go from the inside out. So water will be flowing into here and then out the exit. Now, not all of the water is going to make it through. So what we see here is we have a feed solution here. You can see the pump back here pumping water from there uh, into this tube, into here. So we would call this the feed as well, right? That's, we had a feed solution. This would be the feed flow. The membrane itself is, is right here. And if you look closely, you can see that there's sort of a plexiglass thing and then the, this membrane's inside that and it's collecting water, um, whatever water makes its way through. And it's, that water is making its way once it gets out of the membrane, it'll drip down into this collection area, and that's where we're getting the permeate, right? So that's, that's what's happening with the water. Now, the rest of the water that stayed inside the tube and didn't make its way through is being discharged through this side, and that would be the um, retentate. Now, it's not quite clear because there's not as much volume there, but it, um, if you do look closely, it kind of does seem like that's dirtier water than the feed. And it, and it has to be because we see that the permeate water is pretty clean, right? So whatever orange particles they're removing uh, does seem to be working here and doing the filtration. Um, and you'll notice up here there's some sort of a, uh, a valve that is very likely um, adjusted to apply uh, pressure in terms of to force water through a small gap so that there is pressure exerted on the water to make its way outside of the membrane, right? So we will restrict the flow through the retentate line in order to cause that pressure, right? Because otherwise it would just take the path of least resistance and just go straight through. So we, we do want to achieve some sort of a pressure drop across the membrane and that, that would be the, the way they're doing that. But you see there's still a fair amount of flow going to the permeate um, and a fair amount of flow going to the retentate. So maybe even about an equal amount, kind of hard to say. So that's, that's what, what it might look like in a lab scale process. In uh, larger processes, we're going to have uh, much larger components, but they're going to be a similar, similar situation. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about that scale up in a moment, but uh, first, a few of the design parameters we want to consider would really be uh, first of all the contaminant size. What are we trying to remove? Sometimes we might simply be trying to remove large particles that are going to get in the way of an industrial process, right? Maybe we're taking river water and using it for, I don't know, pumping it into um, trucks that we're, are going to be used to go clean the streets. And, you know, I, I doubt this is that the way they really do it, but Let's say the only concern is for the plumbing to get messed up and they just have to get all the sediment and any, any particles that would clog up the, the piping in the truck and then they're good to go. It doesn't really matter the water quality after that. that probably they would care, but um, if that was the case, you just need a membrane small, you know, with small enough pores to get rid of that stuff, right? Or maybe you have a sequen sequence of membranes so to get better and better quality water. You don't want to use a really, really fancy small pore size membrane to treat the big stuff because it's more expensive and it's more fragile. So you would sequence like the, the big membrane, 
remove the large stuff, that doesn't cost as much pressure, and then you sequentially go down to smaller and smaller things. So the contaminant size that you're looking at really determines the pore size of the membrane that you need. And that's gonna tell you something about what kind of pressure you have to apply and what kind of flux you can get out. So in the sense that you're gonna to have to produce some amount of water, you're ultimately gonna have a scenario where your membrane design is gonna be based on what you need. That's pretty obvious, I guess. Um, okay, so there's, there's two things. There's operational pressure, that's kind of your energy requirement, and then operational flux, that's how much water you get out. Um, and so normally you'll have to balance both, how much does it cost to get the amount of water you need. Um, so this is why you know, we don't always just use membranes. We could use membranes for almost everything. You know, as, you'll, as you'll see, we always want to have some residual chlorine for our drinking water, but technically we could use membranes for just about everything but the cost is usually higher than, for, for example, using gravity. Right? If we can use gravity, we don't even need to pressurize this stuff. That'll remove some particles. Then we supplement that with some coagulation, can use gravity. Right? So those are cheaper methods, so uh, it kind of depends on the, that cost analysis. So here's a, a table that, that we can really see exactly how much things are going to cost in terms of how much water we're getting, what kind of size stuff we're looking at. And we looked at this a bit with particle sedimentation. You know, what size are the, the random stuff in the water? Um, we could start off, you know, at the top here, we can see the approximate size of the particle or pore size of our membrane. And up here at 100 micrometers, um, that's the size of our granular filtration stuff, right? So those are, those are pretty large. And you know, what's visible to human, human eyes, uh, we can definitely see individual sand grains, um, but at some point around this area, or I guess I could draw it up here, somewhere around this area is where we stop being able to see things, even if we look really, really close, right? So that's um, maybe in this area. So we can, we can say then that this conventional media um, could be replaced by microfiltration at some point. Um, and that stuff can remove some bacteria, maybe all bacteria if we have a small microfiltration system. Remove algae, sand, not necessarily all the clays. Um, and you can kind of get a picture of what's happening. The operational pressure would be 10 kilopascals. And uh, just as a, a, a note here, if we compare this to how much pressure that water provides when we stack water on top of a filter, like in terms of the granular filtration, or just like how deep you dive in a, a swimming pool or the ocean or something. Um, one meter of hydraulic head of water is about 10 kilopascals. So this, this here is about one meter of water, okay? Um, that also means that when we go up to 100, this should be 10 meters of water. Uh, so that, that can kind of give you an, an Im a, a mental image of how much pressure is required here. All right, likewise, we see the hydraulic flux. We, uh, we saw the same type of term when we were talking about the granular media filters, and we had some values over here that were you know, a pretty good amount of water per, per area. By the time we're down to microfiltration levels, we're getting about a, 100 liters per square meter of a membrane per hour. So one, one square meter of a membrane, uh, could give you 100 liters over the course of one hour when operated with, you know, five to 10 meters of water pressure on top of it. So you can kind of think of it that way. Um, once we get down to ultrafiltration, uh, this here, the upper range of ultrafiltration is in that range where we could practically, you know, take a elevated tank of water and push water through an ultrafiltration membrane. In fact. Uh, there was a, a neat one that I saw that for disaster relief um, type of context called the sky hydrant. And the, the whole design was, hey, get elevated water, about 10 meters, so 30, 35 feet range. And that water should supply enough pressure to, to power this membrane. Now, of course, you have to get the water up there. So you have to pump it um, or get it up there in some way. But that'll give the pressure to use this 
ultrafiltration membrane that will remove viruses um, and bacteria, really clean up the water quite a bit, right? To make it, make it pretty safe in terms of at least pathogens. So, so that's pretty neat. Um, as soon as you're going down further than that, if you're trying to get rid of some of this organic matter that's in the water naturally, maybe some metals, um, large, uh, you know, large molecules like pesticides, you're really getting down to the point where you're, you're getting in this blurry range of nanofiltration. At some point, you might call it reverse osmosis. You can see these are overlapping. That's kind of just uh, fuzzy boundaries for the categories here. And at that point, what, what you'll see is this hydraulic flux what used to be a, a decent amount of water, the more you go this way, the less flux you're getting out, um, but also the higher pressure requirement. So as we, as we go down in size, that causes an increase in pressure, which is, you know, cost, and a decrease in flux. So it's like times two more costly as we, as we go down. And we see that's happening on somewhat of an exponential scale, or I guess maybe matching the exponential scale. All right, so 100 liters per square meter per hour for the microfiltration, 10 liters per square meter per hour for the nanofiltration, and one, you know, so 100 times less uh, for the reverse osmosis compared to microfiltration. So all that to say is we just don't get nearly as much water out and we're paying a lot more for the, to pressurize it for desalination because reverse osmosis is where we can start desalinating. That's the aqueous salts, right? So um, if we want to desalinate, we certainly can. However, it's, a, it's not necessarily um, cost effective, right? So if we have alternatives, that might be better. Um, likewise, we can say to ourselves, well, if, uh, if we can manage to have a cheap, uh, constant supply of energy, maybe nuclear power or something, then that could, that could be a great pairing with desalination if that's, uh, something that's needed. So that's a lot of infrastructure. Desalination itself is a fair amount of infrastructure. There are still costs in terms of, oh, what do we do with this brine now? How to distribute that appropriately back into the ocean or somewhere where it's not going to cause, cause issues for you know, making an environment way too salty. Okay, so that's a, kind of a big picture of the, the types of filtration, membrane filtration that we might be looking at and uh, some considerations there. So these trends, um, the reverse osmosis, by the way, I mentioned this already, but this is like, you have to have some amount of pressure to fight osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is what makes, like, it's that gradient between salty and non-salty. So um, if, you, if you remember from biology, if you have really salty, really salty water and a cell, the water's, it's gonna try to pull the water out of the cell if, if the outside environment is more salty than the inside the cell or vice versa. So you have to pressure, pressurize to fight that even if you had a perfect membrane that's a lot of energy. And our membranes are actually pretty close to perfect in, sen in the sense of getting to that energy balance. Okay, so there's a couple types of membranes we could talk about in terms of physical, physically how we make them. Uh, one would be uh, polymer membranes or polymeric. Uh, polymer is just a long chain of molecules that have attached together. Um, you could think of styrene or polystyrene, that's where we get styrofoam, right? That happens to be a molecule that looks something like this. And so this would be what we'd call a monomer. And then in a polymer polymerization reaction, we would cause a whole bunch of these to bond together. And then we have polystyrene, um, for example. So the poly meaning many, and then styrene is the molecule, is the monomer. So things like that will happen. Um, we can, that, that's what a polymer is. DNA is a type of polymer, if you wanna think about it that way. Uh, cellulose is, is polymeric, a natural one. Um, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, 
uh, PMMA is uh, polymethylmethacrylate or acrylics. Um, there's a whole bunch, right? There are plastics everywhere. All of us are wearing clothes that contain polymers in them, most, most often synthetic, but even cotton, you know, the fibers, that's a natural polymer, right, of some sort. So there's polymers kind of everywhere. Um, in, in, that, in some sense, these are, I guess, petroleum derived uh, largely. Uh, but we can make polymers into, you know, all sorts of objects, right? So we can make them into membranes, design them. Um, maybe we just have it very stringy and, and make like spaghetti polymer mesh and then use that as a filter. And that's actually one of our approaches. It's like um, electrospray and you, you spray this spaghetti-like flat sheet and you have a membrane. Um, you could, you know, poke holes in it, uh, a nice thin flat sheet of polymer of some sort and blast it with um, a little tiny particles to make little holes. That, that's actually another um, strategy. So there's all sorts of ways we can, we can take polymeric materials, which are organic, um, you know, lots of different materials. And they're kind of nice because plastics are generally fairly cheap, right? So there's some advantages there we can take, uh, we can make use of, uh, make a lot of it, make it repeatable. Um, and make it pretty accurate. So some good options there, but we do have a limit in terms of when we want to clean them, when they get all fouled up with the, the particles, um, then you know we can only do so much heating, chemical stuff, because we could degrade the polymer itself, right? Some, some plastic stuff should not go in the dishwasher because the cleaning is gonna deform it, right? It's, it's gonna be too hot or whatever. Uh, we can't necessarily bleach all of our polymers because we might, and the, you know, the chlorine might actually react with the polymer stuff it, themselves and break it down. So, so we have some limited cleaning options, um, but otherwise some, some good things. Uh, you might be able to control the surface characteristics, make it charged or not charged to help reject certain types of particles. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research and a lot of options when it comes to polymer uh, membranes. Um, I just want you to know that's probably the most common version is some sort of a polymer matrix that, that is used in some form or another. Okay, so then ceramic filters um, are another option. Now, these are just really high-tech ceramics. And if you've ever done anything with ceramics, you'll, you'll know that when you make, you know, something out of clay and then you fire it, typically you have these little holes in it. And you can imagine if you do that just right, those could be little pores that water could pass through um, if you design it right. So you can go high tech with it and design um, ceramic membranes. Now, the definition of membrane is like a pliable sheet. Ceramics are not gonna be so pliable. Um, so we're kind of getting rid of that part of the definition, I guess. Um, but it, you can make it in such a way that it is a sheet um, or, or one of those cylinder type situations. Um, and then one of the advantages is you could probably use higher pressure with that because the ceramic is sort of robust. It's not going to squash flat like you might think, you know, if you put enough pressure on some sort of plastic, it's going to give and then it's going to just flatten. So if you, if you normally wanted something that, you know, looked a little bit like this with pores going through and then like really tiny pores right on the surface, um, if you put too much pressure on that and this thing's made of plastic, um, so you can potentially get higher pressure, operating pressure for the ceramic. And if you know about ceramics, you can probably cook with them. You could potentially bleach them. You could, you could do a lot to them. You could heat it quite a lot, bake with it. Um, and assuming you're careful with it, it should survive all that. So there's a lot better cleaning options. You could acid wash it, base wash it, you know, blast it with chlorine. A lot of stuff is chemically resistant, heat resistant. So cleaning options are a lot a lot easier given the balance of, well, you also have to be, you know, a little more careful with it. Okay, so those are the two types of materials we would use um, or generically. Um, you might also use these ceramic uh, membranes in the case if, let's say you had some uh, power plant and you were capturing a lot of the air pollution with some water stream. You'll end up with the hot water 
that's contaminated and you're gonna try to consolidate that contamination into a smaller stream. Maybe you wanna use a, a ceramic membrane because it can handle the high heat without cooling the water first. You'll actually get some benefit because the um, dynamic viscosity of the water is a lot smaller when it's hotter. That means there's less resistance for it to pass through the membrane. So it's actually a, a pretty good uh, benefit here at high temperatures. So we'll say low viscosity at high temperatures. Um, that's actually a project while I was in graduate school, a, a lab mate of mine was working on that for his master's project. Okay, so what do they actually look like? And here's where normally I would take a couple of sheets of paper. And if you, if you just take like three or four sheets of paper, stagger them a little bit, and then wrap them around themselves, you could see that you'll make a little bit of a, some kind of a cylinder where you have different layers of you know, one piece of paper, then another, and another. And we would call this a spiral wound uh, membrane setup where we have several sheets of the membrane. We've wound them around each other. And as you see in this picture, um, carefully inserting like a, a layer where it will let water pass through it's going to support them to keep the keep them separate to have a little bit of separation between the these membranes but also allow water to freely flow so once it water passes across one membrane then it can freely flow through the spiral until it comes out or it enters the middle there you can kind of see in this drawing the water is going to enter that middle having traveled through that spiral um, there's a lot of you know, fine scale plumbing here to make sure that water can't just bypass that membrane, just to make sure that the only place the water can go is either across the membrane or back out the other way without ever getting into the, the, the permeate solution. So in this case, if you look closely, we have the feed solution here going into kind of the sides of our spiral membrane system. And then it's plumbed or piped in such a way that water that gets across one of these sheets can make its way into this tube inside, and this is coming out as the permeate, um, and you could collect it from one side or the other or both, right? So the deal is here, it's coming in the in-between spaces, and that means whatever doesn't make it across the membranes will come out from in-between on the other side. So the permeate, um, or the, excuse me, the retentate is right here, The permeate is coming out through um, through these guys, one side or the other, and the feed is right here. So really, this is a fancy way of taking what would be like one square meter of, of membrane um, and finding a way to fit that in a much more compact uh, in, enclosure. Right, so the, the fact that we're gonna need a lot of surface area means we need to get a high surface area to volume um, structure. So flat sheets are not particularly high surface area to volume, but a, a spiral wound thing that has several flat sheets all wound up in here and now occupies this is a much higher surface area to volume ratio there. So a lot of the, the physical forms are gonna follow that trend of trying to, to get high surface area in a relatively smaller area to get all this filtration done that we need to produce a bunch of water. So the next one um, would be tubular. And, and actually just a note here, tubular as we saw in that, uh, that lab picture, that one could have been polymeric or ceramic. You can imagine making a ceramic tube, right? That, that doesn't seem too difficult. The flat sheet ones, those are probably just gonna be polymeric because you, you're probably gonna have a difficult time winding a ceramic <laughs> Uh, thing like that or crafting it in that way and then getting it all perfect nestled into one another and all that okay so tubular membranes we could look at in this type of a form uh, and this actually looks a lot like that one we saw on the lab scale except that one just had one tube right so it could be one tube in inside this outer sheathing uh, but you'll see both systems have the same type of deal right we have water coming through into the tube on one side, or tubes, and then if it makes it out 
and across the membrane into this interstitial area, then you've got permeate. It has permeated through and now it can be collected. And you see in this case, it's collecting through here or otherwise it escapes out the other side. And again, we would apply some pressure uh, valve or something to pressurize it so that we are applying pressure across the membrane. Um, so that would be that would be needed. So again, we've got the uh, permeate here, the feed on the left side, and the retentate over here. Okay, so you can see you can stack several of these um, cylinders into one enclosure. Again, increasing your surface area to volume a, a fair bit. <coughs> so that might bring a logical next question. Well, why don't we just do that, but with a lot of them and a lot smaller? And sure enough, that's common practice. That is what we would call hollow fiber membranes. Again, these are probably only polymeric because it wouldn't really uh, be practical to make a lot of very thin tubes of uh, ceramics. As soon as you jostle it, they'll all break. Um, so these are going to be polymeric. That means we are going to have some limitations on how much pressure we can apply to these. Um, you know, and just the, the thin size of them, the fact that they are very thin little tubes of polymers. Um, if we were to apply too much pressure, you could see that, you know, if we were going outside in, they would probably just collapse like a straw. Um, you know, or, well, even if you're withdrawing too, you might have them collapse if you're withdrawing pressure like that. So they are um, certainly possible to use, but um, not, uh, not for every application. But as you see here, we get a really high surface area to volume ratio, and we can get a lot of, uh, a lot of membrane in this one unit. So that's pretty common to use. It's operating just like the tubular membranes otherwise. Um, and one thing to note here, and we'll do a problem on this, if you have any sort of a tubular membrane, whether it's uh, large or it's these hollow fibers, you're going to have some geometry at play because your surface area for the filter and the surface area is going to be very important. It can either be dictated by that inner diameter if you are operating from inside out, or it could be the outer diameter if you're going from outside in in terms of the direction of filtration. So we have an outer or an inner diameter. So that'll be very important to know how much surface area do we actually have. Another aspect of that is we actually tend to try to design them for one or the other, because if we have a membrane, usually what we want to do, it's going to have some thickness. Usually what we want is to have large pores, let's say on the bottom side here, that's not the separation layer. So large channels for water to, to go through and then really small pores, so it's a fine structure at the surface where you're actually doing the filtration. Um, you don't want to operate backwards because then particles are getting stuck inside the support layer and it gets much more difficult to actually treat this. So in this case, you want water to go this way, not this way, right? We don't like that because that's gonna get all those particles stuck in the larger area before they meet the fine separation layer. Um, and so we, we try to avoid that. Um, so that means when we, when we have a system um, that, that can be like this hollow fiber system, we need to make sure we're matching our actual uh, membrane design to if it's supposed to be going inside out, we operate it that way. Um, because this tube probably has either the separation layer on the inside or maybe on the outside. So one or the other would tell us, you know, which way we need to go. Okay, so let's take a, a couple minutes to do an example problem. Uh, make sure you've got a good handle on this, uh, the terminology here and what this might look like. So we have a, a dead end filtration setup. So we say a membrane filter is used to concentrate an algae sample for culture analysis. So we're intentionally concentrating something. We're gonna use a membrane to do it. 
Um, so it's going to be a relatively simple mass balance. Um, and we say a membrane has a pore size of 0.45 micrometers, uh, and it's used to reject 90% of the algae. Um, I'm highlighting that 90% because you could try this with 100% or 50% um, and see what happens to your mass balance. Um, but in this case, let's try for 90% of the algae. The filtration cell has a volume of 0.5 liters and can be operated in either cross flow or dead end mode. And initially, we're going to use this dead end filtration mode. And it says if the initial concentration of the algae is 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter, and the initial volume is 500 milliliters, what is the concentration of the algae in the feed if 450 milliliters of the solution is passed through the membrane? So I'd highly recommend drawing it up and visualizing what that actually is asking for. So take a few minutes to do that, and then I'll, I'll work through it with you.
All right, so hopefully you were able to draw something that looks kind of like this, where you have half a liter to start with. You remove most of that, actually 90% of that, and you're left with 50 milliliters or 0 0.05 liters afterwards, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the verbal sketch that we were given. So drawing it, uh, I hope, is pretty helpful. Um, and then we're also given some initial concentration, 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter. Um, and we're asked to give the final concentration of cells in the, uh, the remaining uh, solution in the feed. So that should be just 50 milliliters remaining. Um, so what's the concentration there? Uh, the way I would define that as a way to, to like look towards this uh, solution would be to simply say, well, some amount of cells are gonna be remaining after that filtration step. And we can divide that over the volume that's still remaining, which is, should be that 50 milliliters or 0 0.05 liters. So then you can find, well, most of those cells should still be there. Uh, we'll do this in a moment, but some would have escaped through the membrane, right? Um, so we could find how many cells escaped um, based on that 10% that should be making it through. So we could take, um, First of all, we could find the total number of cells. Total cells would be equal to this 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter times our starting volume, which was 0.5 liters. So that should give us half of 3.75. That should be what, uh, 1.75 um, times 10 to the fifth cells total. So I'll just write cells. Okay, so that's how many we started with. And so then the question would be, how many cells are removed? There should be some other ways we could do this with mass balances and things. This is just kind of the way my, my brain's approaching it. Um, fairly intuitive sense, you know, um, just following it that way. Uh, so the number of cells removed would be the, the 450 milliliters. I'm going to say 0.45 liters times the concentration of cells there, 3.5 times 10 to the fifth cells per liter. And almost all of those are retained. It's only 10% of those that actually pass through the membrane and escape. Um, well, so actually what I'm asking here is how many cells are escaping. Um, cells removed. I guess maybe I'm saying cells remaining. That's, that's not very clear, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and say, um, cells remaining here, sorry for the notes. Cells remaining should be one minus, or the total, I guess total minus, minus the amount that escaped, right? So then if I wanna find the amount escaped, we can say that 450 uh, milliliters times the concentration we had times that 10%, and so we'll write that as 0.01. Um, so this should give us a value of how many escaped. Uh, so that'll be 3.5 times 10 to the fourth times 0.45. So I'm just gonna do that in Excel real quick. What's the question? The feed is what's going like, if we put a membrane on the bottom of this bottle, the feed is, is this solution, and we're going to push it through the membrane. So what is the initial concentration of cells here? Um, it was given. That's the 3.5 times 10 to the fifth. Like, like, what is it? Like, like, how is that not the concentration of the stuff going into the feed? That is the concentration of the feed. But once we've, the, the question says, what's the concentration um, in the feed 
if something happened, right? So the thing that happened is we, we pushed water through. So now we have a new feed. We, we could call that maybe the retentate, the re remaining volume, but it's still in the feed, we could still push more through, right? So it's still kind of the feed. I totally understand the, the, the confusion there. Um, yeah, so, and that, that kind of goes back to like, when we drop the picture, like what is the feed? Like that totally uh, makes sense um, that that's unclear that way. Okay, so I'm gonna say 3.5 times 10 to the fifth times, times 0.1 times 0.45. Uh, so 15,750 cells have escaped. So that means that of our 350,000 or whatever that is, um, 175,000, excuse me, cells this many escaped. So the number remaining will be equal to, we'll do that on the calculator, this will be 1.75 times 10 to the fifth minus that answer. I'm just gonna go ahead and put this in scientific as well. So 1.59 times 10 to the fifth. Okay, so what, what we see real quick here is this should be less than we started with, some are escaping, um, but we didn't, we should not have, it should not be too far from it because only 10% were escaping. We filtered most of the water, but not all of it, so it gets a little hairy to estimate by hand, but, or in your head, but we went from 1.75 to 1.59, so that looks pretty good to me. And now we just calculate, okay, how many are left given that we only have 50 milliliters of that volume? The feed, right? So we only have a little bit of the feed left uh, that we might call retentate. Um, so we're gonna say this final or feed concentration at the end. I, I wrote that CF to mean C final, um, but I guess we could call it the feed in, in that sense. Um, so this one will be equal to that answer divided by 0 0.05 liters. Uh, that puts us in cells per liter as a final uh, unit. And so that gives us 3.19 times 10 to the six. Cells per liter. Okay, does that make sense? So the wording of the question itself is admittedly a bit confusing. Um, the, the dead end filtration in that manner is, is just a bit confusing, right? Because yeah, if we stop at some point, we could stop a bunch of times along the way and ask ourselves, what's the current concentration now? How about if 10 more milliliters, right? Um, so we could think about it, you know, in the case that we're just stopping at that one moment. Okay. All right, so I think that's, all I'm gonna do this time, and we'll uh, we'll get into some of the pressure fouling kind of stuff um, when we return next week. So, have a good uh, question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I forget what exactly the quiz I posted. It might just be that problem. Um, I posted. Okay, so I posted a membrane quiz. I think that one's due later this week, or is that? Tuesday next week. Okay, yeah, I think I gave you a full week. Um, I don't remember exactly what's on that. I looked at it yesterday and already forgot. So it might just be that problem we did. So yay you if, if so. Um, it might be a small calculation problem or just some generic about membranes type of problems. Um, so it might be worth waiting until after next class where we're going to finish the membrane stuff to do it. I also posted the cryptosporidium quiz. I think that's due that Friday of next week. So a couple like activities here, just just class participation activities. Um, yeah, thank you for that reminder.